Hey, so uh, I have a thing sent in by an alert listener, uh, which might be vandalism, food vandalism. Oh, now that's new. Or it might be a, a deeply inept food heist. You know, we haven't even touched food vandalism. I bet there's a lot. There probably are. Like, you know, smear. I, I guess anytime someone's egg, house get eggs, it gets egged, <laughs> yeah. can't speak today. Mm-hmm. That's food vandalism. That's food vandalism. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ariana Grande licking all those donuts. That was food vandalism. <laughs> I have no idea what you're even <laughs> you, talking what? about. What? You didn't hear about that? I vaguely, it crossed like my desk. But like, I was it really Ariana Grande? Ariana, Ariana Grande, really for real, in the era of cell phones, decided it would be a good idea to lick a bunch of donuts that she wasn't going to buy. So I think I saw that video and did not connect. It was Ariana Grande. I yeah. thought it was just dumb college person. kid licking donuts and thinking it was silly. I mean, you're not super wrong. It was okay. <laughs> okay. And then like there were copycats and there were people who would film themselves going mm-hmm. in and like taking the lid off of ice cream in a grocery yeah. store and licking that. I know that whole phase started. She kicked yeah. that off. I don't know if she kicked it off or if she was just a part of it. I but mean, can we go a, back a very to very influential person? So let's give her credit. Grabbing ice cream cones by the ice cream instead—that was a much better prank. Because <laughs> you'd paid for the ice cream already. Uh huh. And yeah. Um. Okay. Well. Yeah. Food vandalism. N- n- now that we've so, talked wait, about. Wait, is food yes. vandalism vandalism to food or f- vandalism using food? Because I was imagining it's vandalism using, using food, food. But you're talking about vandalism upon the food. Yes. Well, at the scale of this article, mm-hmm. it's both. Okay. <laughs> so before we get to this, let me ask you a question. Okay. Isaac, our mutual friend, mm-hmm. um, VP of Creative Development here. He has a dream to someday lick a Van Gogh. To lick a Van Gogh. Yes. It's okay. always stuck in my head because well, then. he's an artist. He thinks the paint looks so thick and uh, interesting <laughs> on a Van Gogh because he's, you know, he's a painter. And he's always been like, I, my secret dream is to someday lick a Van Gogh. And... Um, <laughs> Does well, the we just Van got Gogh him be- banned from every art museum. Yeah. Does the Van Gogh become food if he licks if, it? If he licks it? Yeah. I don't know. And is that then vandalism, food vandalism I've of a Van Gogh? licked a lot of things that I don't know if they <laughs> count as food, right? <laughs> I thought we discussed phrasing. Yes, Dan. phrasing. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. that was the whole joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me do your food. Let okay. me hear your food. So heist. here we go. Yeah. This happened in Spain. Spain. I like Spain. In Ribera del Duero, uh, the Cepa 21 winery, or as okay. they would say it, the Cepa 21 winery. That's right. Uh, somebody sneaked in, and the big vats where they kind of cure the wine. I don't know if you call it curing. They ferment the wine. Okay. Uh, they just opened the nozzles and sprayed 63. Thousand liters of wine onto the floor. It's got to be worth a lot. Estimated at over two million dollars, yeah. two and a half million dollars worth of lost wine. Because you said sixty, and I, I thought to hear a thousand euros, and then <laughs> no, heard, yeah. sixty thousand liters. Um, yeah, so potentially a food heist if they were just really bad and were like, I forgot the buckets. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you stop. After the first one, if you forgot the bucket, like well, one, yes. What what kind of what kind of heist? Unless it was your job, it's a whole team of experts, and your job is to open all the valves, uh-huh. and then Reggie's supposed to run in with, with the, the buckets, buckets, and then he didn't run in with the buckets. Uh, how are you going to get sixty thousand liters out in buckets, Dan? Well. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a lot of buckets. You will have to have a yeah. lot of buckets, won't mm-hmm. you? Um, yeah. I, and I, possibly I, some 10-gallon hats. Um, I'm not going to even <laughs> grace that one with the roof. <laughs> Why? Um, I, I think your postulization, I think your, uh, your thought regarding it maybe being incompetent thieves 
is a little far fetched. It is a pretty far fetched. Yes, uh, they are pretty much certain that this is sabotage. They mm-hmm. uh, have no idea yet who yeah. did it. Well, at least at the time that this article was written, they didn't know who did mm-hmm. it. This article's from. Uh, oh, Monday. So okay. it's still very recent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might uh, they they might have a suspect. They might not. We'll yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. And like I said, at that scale, you are destroying the wine and potentially destroying a, a large portion of the winery because you've soaked it in sixty thousand gallons of alcohol. The champagnes. <laughs> It's not champagne, so yeah. it doesn't quite work. But, but that champagne does sound like a cool like, indie S, band name. Right? Champagne. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good, uh, pretty good food heist name. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Wine. Yeah, I mean the winers is just too obvious. The winers. It, and that would only count if they were like protesting something by this is just being a pain. So mm-hmm. yeah. Their name should be about cheese instead, and then just connoisseurs will connect it with wine intellectually. Um, I'm sure that's exactly what will happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, I like this new uh, this new branch of food heist um, mm-hmm. potential lore. The the food crime yeah uh, canon continues to expand. Yes. Though it is not what I thought. I thought we would be hearing about someone who you know smashed potatoes through smashed All potatoes at things. the wall. And yeah. but nope. This is uh, this is just. We're ruining a bunch of wine because, for whatever reason. Yeah. So the wine wasn't stolen. Yes. Um, or at least it wasn't taken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so no food heist prison for this guy. But no. do you suppose that in food heist prison, they are just boiling mad at him for wasting for this... wasting all the food? Yeah. Because their food... I mean, this might be a turf war themselves. that we're talking about. Yeah, this yeah. is like the anarchist of the food heist world. It's yeah, this is like, the Joker. Burn it down. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares. Yeah, yeah. They 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 definitely hate this person. Yeah, uh, for their wasting of wine and not even for. Yeah, I mean, it's so much easier to just. I mean, mm-hmm. if you don't need, it's always easier to break. If you don't need story. like forty thousand buckets, then I mean, what are you even doing? Right? <laughs> the true food yeah. heist masters will get those 40,000 buckets. I know a bucket can carry more than later, but you know. Um, those guys that stole like 2 million pounds of butter are sitting yeah. there thinking, no one has a work ethic anymore. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, it's this economy. <laughs> the, the I knew if the... I just kept making dumb jokes, one of them would get you. So, so, so what you're saying is the the food heist experts, because it's a bad economy, have been reduced to destroying instead of stealing because the economy is bad. No, I'm saying the that jobs the experts they can get... are looking out at everyone else and they're saying, "Oh, just food vandalism, not heist." No, Nobody no. wants to work anymore. That's oh, okay. That's like those. It's mm-hmm. those those Zoomers and those Millennials. Yeah. It's like the Boomer f- food heisters. Like back in my day, we would have taken all that wine <laughs> and we would have sold it to a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just thinking of someone who's like an expert in food heist, being like, "What jobs can I get?" And they're like, "Sorry, we don't we don't have anything you can steal. You're just gonna have to go to vandalism." They're like, "That pays so much worse." Um, but it's, it's just the only job you can get. <laughs> if you go to a fancy restaurant mm-hmm. and you order wine and they lug it out in like one of those white plastic five gallon mm-hmm. buckets, you know that they're buying black market wine. Uh, I had a good meal actually this week. I got, got to go to the tree room. I was up at Sundance. Ooh. It was good food there. Well, mm-hmm. and you went to Walter's last night. I did go to Walter's last night. Very I good was very food jealous. There. Yeah. So I've, uh, I've had, I've kind of had a foodie, um, a foodie week. I have not eaten today. Mm. <laughs> I did eat a piece of bread because there's bread outside. We will make sure that you get some food sometime <laughs> tonight. I yeah. have found, mm-hmm. and I suspect this is part of the whole depression thing, I don't eat when I'm alone anymore. Eating is a purely social activity for me, which is weird because I used to just devour everything I could see. That does sound like a depression thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Okay. There you go. I did have a cherry limeade today, mm. but that's there's there's not a lot of protein and minerals in those. No. 
Um, I was just thinking, your white, your beard coming in white. You're <laughs> heading towards Santa Claus territory. Should I grow it out until I? I bet you could all you the could, way till Christmas. I bet you could Santa. I went to LTUE mm-hmm. last weekend, yeah. uh, which is our local little regional con, mm-hmm. and. You know, at one point went in to use the hotel restroom, and I realized, looking in the mirror, I'm one of the weird old guys at the con. Like, I I went to that con uh, when I was 18, freshman mm-hmm. year of college. I've been going to that con forever, but now I'm one of the weird old guys. And it's interesting, because you're younger than me, Man. but I don't think I'm one of the weird old guys yet. Well, you you haven't raised my son yet no and i <laughs> didn't uh have depression that kind of came to the head uh, ahead in the last couple of years between well, yes having a beard and not mm-hmm. having a beard and having a beard again that's true so uh, we I had think- that big meeting yesterday with all the officers and yep. i looked around and i realized uh, scar and i are the gray ones mm-hmm. and scar and i are the ones with adult children yes um, yes and then i realized wait becky also has an adult child and she looks Young as the day is long, and I was very offended. Well, I mean, you'd have to really compare Pete, uh, her husband, and ha- have a look. That's uh, true. They they do have they He's do have probably adult children. more gray than she is. So I don't have adult children yet. Yeah, uh, a year and a half away though. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joel will turn eighteen in about a year and a half. That's so not bad. Mm-hmm. He is playing D and D with his friends. Yay! Yep. So. He's got a nice batch of friends who are rolling up new characters. I love it. So, uh, what are we going to actually talk about today? Okay, we got so like 20 minutes left. Here's here's my idea. Okay. And if this fails, it's not going to... See, Becky walked in because she heard us talking, saying nice things about her. Um, mm-hmm. If it fails, it will not be the first time that we have had a topic that fails. Nope, nope. Um, but I have been thinking lately, uh, because you can look at... Uh, you know, we had this huge boom of superhero movies where it right. seemed that every single big ticket movie was a superhero movie for mm-hmm. like 15 years. Uh, and Hollywood has gone through cycles like that before. Yep. In the 80s, we had the big muscly action hero uh, Stallone and Schwarzenegger era. Right. Uh, and before that, we had a huge musical era where everything had songs in it. Uh, before that, there were a solid 10 years where every big movie that came out was a Western. Yeah, to the point um, that to get Star Trek made, Gene Roddenberry had to call it a we- Wagon space Train Western. to the Stars. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was th- I was wondering, I've been wondering to myself, yes. what's next? And I don't know if there's any way to predict that. So, but- yeah, I mean, the what's next, I don't think I'm equipped to do so either. Um, I think the superhero boom was one of these things that, in hindsight, was kind of inevitable. Uh, because you'll notice, at least I will notice, I've noticed, we didn't get a really big space opera boom after Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And that is be- not for lack of trying. Yeah, It's because the special effects, unless you were ILM uh, starting out, were too cheap look- looking and too bad mm-hmm. in order to actually create that fantasy yeah and so we did get like a whole bunch of like cheap knockoffs and a whole bunch of expensive knockoffs and even things like uh lynch's dune where everyone's like well sci-fi is the next big thing but mm-hmm. they couldn't make it work because they didn't have the special yeah. effects yet we saw attempts mm-hmm. that's where Battlestar galactica came from yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but we didn't see a big new wave of it yeah um, but we did see a lot, um, like Star Wars, um, it's Star Wars, The Godfather, and Jaws that are credited with starting the, uh, the kind of boom of the, the tentpole blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we did see is they went to things that they could make with their current special effects budget, and some of those were definitely sci-fi. Right, we're just yeah. not talking space opera. So you ended up with a lot of the Schwarzenegger movies were science fiction mm-hmm. um, and things like that. But what they and, and so you ended up with the the muscly um, guys genre, as you mm-hmm. talked about. We also ta- saw the boom of horror and particularly the slasher yeah. flick because the special effects didn't need to be amazing yeah. or could be really subdued. The Seventies and eighties yeah. slasher boom is absolutely another one of these. Yeah. Uh, and I think the superhero one was kind of inevitable because 
once the special effects, talking particularly like the CG and things like that, mm -hmm. caught up to the imagination, um, it's a nice kind of, um, like most superhero stories are portal fantasies, meaning you're gonna start in the real world and then you're going to transition to a fantastical, and it's not a whole world, mm -hmm. but normal character gets superpowers and you're led easily into the, the fantasy world. It's a very, um, it's a very, Easy way, easy is the wrong term because I, I would I would say yeah, Lord of yeah. the Rings is a bit of one as well, right? Because mm -hmm. you start in the Shire and then transition out. You start with the familiar and go to the strange. And superhero is just a, a perfect way. Um, by the end of the superhero genre, we had a whole bunch of Star Wars. So what Guardians mm -hmm. of the Galaxy and all the cosmic stuff yeah. uh, was. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that what they tried to do in the early 80s, they could only do... Once they had special Once effects, they had all that stuff, and they could lead the audience into it mm -hmm. um, with that kind of yeah. portal. Because um, we had, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a little before. In fact, several years before the superhero started, we had Fifth Element. Yeah, uh, but then we didn't really get all the space operas until uh, Jupiter Ascending and whatever mm -hmm. the terrible uh, French one was. Um, um, uh, Valerian in the Valerian. city. Yeah. Of a thousand, um, whatever. And yeah. So, I think the so problem we is. We did eventually get to those. We did, but they didn't take off because they didn't have a seed um, film to really exploded for everyone to, uh, to copy. Mm -hmm. And for that seed film to work, like, you will find good sci fi space operas all the way through. Mm -hmm. But the, the seed one was Star Wars, and then we got the big boom following it, and they all flopped. Same thing happened with, uh, with fantasy films. Yeah, uh, Lord of the Rings was a big seed property. Mm -hmm. um, everyone tried to copy it, but they the only successful one was the first Narnia movie. Uh, yeah, I would say, and they they or actually Pirates of the Caribbean is probably in that same. Yeah, uh, I mean those ooh, are. I think we do have to call that. The problem is the first one's not an epic fantasy, but two and three are. Mm -hmm. But the first one's the strong one, and it's more of a straight up. I yeah. mean, it, it is. It has it's epic fantasy. And it has undead yeah. in it. But, um, yeah. But you you had this seed movie of Lord of the Rings, uh, and then no one could replicate it. They they went and they bought a whole bunch of YA properties. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was partially That's a when mistake. we got Aragon. Yeah. That's when we got um, uh, Lightning, the first Lightning Thief, or whatever that yeah. was called. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it was they. There were a whole bunch of them. Golden Compass. It, it's because yeah. they were making those movies at the same time that uh, the YA dystopia boom was huge. Yeah, and so people said, "Well, everyone loves Hunger Games, and everyone loves Lord of the Rings. Let's buy Aragon," and it just didn't work out. I think that I, I've for a long time during this period, I'm like, they they learned the wrong lesson. Um, what people were waiting for in Lord of the Rings. Uh, as a seed film, was to see the great epic fantasies um, mm -hmm. like for a more mature audience. It doesn't have to be Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones is the only one that really managed to, yeah. to land in that patch other than um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And both of those are not YA properties. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the problem is, is all the YA properties were... They were misfiring a little bit. Um, they weren't hitting that older demographic that wanted to see Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I know they tried some some really good ones, but they also just weren't able to weren't able to make a lot of good ones. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah. uh, the Golden Compass is an amazing book, uh, but the film is a bit of a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, have we talked about Golden Compass? I don't think we have. Um, I. Read the whole series. Mm -hmm. uh, did not like the movie at all. Haven't yep. watched the TV series yet. I haven't watched it either. I have a theory on the t on the film though. It's it's one of these things that, like, the film should have worked. Uh, the casting is excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, the people, as I imagine them in the book, came to life on the screen. They tried really hard to stay true to the lore and the narrative of the book, and. Uh, the, the visuals were stunning, and the movie was boring. Um, and it's just one of those things where translating the book to a film, staying true to it, didn't work for whatever reason. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those case studies where I'm like, what? And I can't even really figure it out. What went wrong in trying to stay, stay so true and do such a good job to make a film so bad? 
I don't know. Uh, that would be one where we need like a Patrick Willems to analyze yeah. that rather than us. Yeah, because um, for a while I'm like, well, you must not be able to translate a book straight to a film and have it work. But Dune, as we were talking about before we started filming, um, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one translation, but it's as close. It's a pretty yeah. faithful one. It's as close as Golden Compass is. Uh, and it's great. It's mm -hmm. really watchable. It's And it's um, so yeah. obviously you can do it. You can <laughs> you could take it and go one-to-one -one essentially and make a mm -hmm. great film. Yeah. And Even, I don't know yeah. enough about film to know if that's something, did the script fall down? Did the yeah. directing fall down? Did the editing fall down? Um, yeah. I think it's I at least know. partially the script because when I was watching Golden Compass and analyzing it, having read the book, um, they weren't, they were so true to the story um, that they wanted to make sure all the info dumps got, mm. all the information got to, and so if you watch that again, there's just a lot of people standing around giving you information. Yeah. And scenes that are dynamic in the book, they didn't have time for. And it's actually faster to just have two people explain the same things you learn from the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, the show versus tell. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's almost always takes more time to show than to tell. And so rather than cut the scene, they trimmed it and had people explain what happened. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then got the information across that way. Yeah. Um, and for all of the the massive liberties that the Lord of the Rings movies take right. with the books, um, one thing that they were doing while trimming down the long stuff and cutting out things they couldn't include, yeah. they were also adding drama constantly, extra character conflicts, extra points of drama to make it as exciting and as compelling as they could. Right, well, and scenes to show like they would cut five big chunks in. This might be easier with Tolkien because some of those <laughs> chunks can be kind of long. And mm -hmm. then you can take those and construct a scene that does the legwork of some of those scenes. Um, I always point out one of my favorite changes is the scene where Sam gets sent away by Frodo and comes back. And it's mm. my favorite change, I think, in all of the Lord of the Rings films. And it's very contentious. Back in the 2000s, uh, people hated this change. Yeah. And it's, it's my favorite because... Um, not having read three books worth of material of those tra traveling together, mm -hmm. it's hard for you to get the same sense of Sam's loyalty in the film that you can in the books, particularly at that point where you've seen him grumbling and complaining. And there's a danger that the film audience would start to say, why is Sam even here? Mm -hmm. um, right? And so you construct a scene that some people think is against encounter to the personality of the characters that Frodo would send Sam away and Sam would go. Mm -hmm. But this scene by him returning and saving Frodo the way he does, like he obviously did, you know, like yeah. that whole thing works so well to prove Sam's loyalty is his superpower that it replaces chapters and chapters, chapters. and chapters yeah. in the, the books. And you could have instead replaced that with a conversation where Sam is like, <laughs> Mr. Frodo, you know that I'm the most loyal person that ever, and you're a, you're <laughs> and a member of this time. I will never leave you. Yeah. Well, and that scene also gives us the shorthand for uh, Gollum is insidious and manipulative. Yep. And Frodo is so corrupted by the ring he can't think straight anymore. Yep. And you get those all showing rather than telling and mm -hmm. compressed and short. So. Uh, it's just a, a brilliant example of how to take what is in a book and make something new that works on the screen to convey the same information. And it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my very favorite moments. And so, yeah, I think that um, that's part of the problem with Golden Compass is it just didn't have those things, uh, which is a real shame because, again, the visual design and the casting – Casting was um, so good. And you can tell the people making this film read and enjoyed the book and were trying hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've all done something where we sit down to write <laughs> something and it doesn't work. And I can see that happening on the screen and my heart goes out to them, mm -hmm. right? There are some yeah. times when people make something and it seems so opposite <laughs> to the concept of the, the original that my heart does not go out to them, shall we say? Mm -hmm. um, like... Um, I don't know. 
Uh, I haven't been able to bring Rings myself power. to watch. <laughs> well, Rings of Power. I, I wouldn't say that on Rings of Power. It's not an opposite thing, but yep. yeah. I, I would say that on something like Halo. Um, mm-hmm. The Halo, Halo television show where it's like... Yeah. Um, they clearly had very little, if any, love for the source material, for yeah. the vibe mm-hmm. uh, uh, that the games give. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to tell a completely different story with the one license they had access to. Exactly. Um, and not to say, some people might enjoy that story. It might be well told in its way. Mm-hmm. But but it's not Halo. But it, yeah. Um, I hear that season two might be better. I haven't watched any of it because I can't bring myself to. But yeah um but yeah so what's next um i think part of the the issue is that we had we could be at the end of the blockbuster era that started Mm -hmm. with uh john's jaws the godfather and uh star wars right which is a big deal we don't know yet but we could be there um and that's a shakeup we haven't seen in hollywood for 50 years Mm -hmm. um and the the fact that major blockbusters with tentpole actors and uh tentpole franchises that get a decent critical reception are flopping Mm -hmm. uh is a very big deal for hollywood and so what's next is i think scarier than it used to be yeah, and and you know if if we're seeing the end of the blockbuster era, mm-hmm. it is more because of technology and viewing patterns yes. than any artistic merit of the movies that come out. Mm-hmm. Um, I I do think that the superhero era really took blockbusters to their apex, right? Yeah, like here's the thing, and everything is going to cost two hundred million now or more, four hundred in a lot of cases. Uh, I remember when Waterworld came out and it crossed 200 million and was at the time the most expensive movie ever made and everyone lost their minds and today that's small change. Um well the other thing that they did is um so I say this fully aware that I am part of one of these, right? Uh mm-hmm. these connected universes are a potential house of cards. Yeah. Um, because one of the problems that I've been very aware of in the Cosmere that I want to be very careful about is um, when people start stop following it, getting back into it is really hard. Mm-hmm. For instance, if you skip five James Bond movies and then you decide to go see one, you're not lost. Yeah, You don't have a problem at all. But if you skip five MCU movies, you're not going to go see the new Avengers movie, which Mm -hmm. is their kind of linchpin where they expect to make their money back, having spent a lot of money setting up these characters. Yeah. And um, that can be a house of cards. And in in spite of that, Mm -hmm. I think that if I were to predict what's next, it's what we can already see growing and what we've had for 10 years, which is long form Storytelling. Well, I think that that's... Um, But is that at its apex? I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I think they're continuing to come out. I think... um, For example, I watched uh, The English on Amazon Mm -hmm. with Emily Blunt and Chasky Spencer. Yep. Uh, It's only five episodes. And they're an hour long. And I realized, oh, this isn't a TV show. This is a miniseries like we used to have on TV when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if if what we see now is the rise of the miniseries... I would love that. A story that is... Too big for a movie mm-hmm. and too small for a show. And so you're just going to give us four, five, six hours of really well done long form content. It seems like that might be the sweet spot that we haven't hit yet. So here's the problem, though. They're going to have to stop writing those like network television shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the problem with uh, Rings of Power. This is the problem, as much as I like it, with Ted Lasso. Uh, this is the problem with um, with Wheel of Time to an extent. Um, is this idea of we aren't embracing the new form? We are trying to write a network show mm-hmm. that just has twelve episodes, and so yeah. uh, the interconnected tissue, the long form character arcs, um, the it doesn't feel like a twelve hour movie. It feels like twelve episodes. 
mm-hmm. with all the foibles of uh, a 24 episode season, uh, yeah. just shorter, just compressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and I do think that Game of Thrones mm-hmm. has a lot to do with how those shows are constructed. Right. Rings of Power did not need to have 10 separate stories with the cast nope. of millions, but Game of Thrones was successful, so of course it did. And I have like, and again. I really do like the whole team working on Wheel of Time. I think they've done some great things. But one of my big fights with the showrunner has been, you know, he's like, well, this is how we do it in television. I'm like, but this is how we do it in long form storytelling, (laughs) right? Um, And what you're making should be more like the long form storytelling rather than the episodic television that Mm -hmm. uh, is his background. That's what he knows how to make. Yeah. Um, and I can't blame him entirely because, you know, you come from network television, you, you learn how to make a show. Um, but I mm-hmm. think I think this is my big problem with some of the streaming shows um, is this this idea. Yeah, I want them to write an entire season. Um, and I want them to workshop that entire season and I want them to get those scripts good and then film that. And I don't see that happening a ton. I see them sitting down and coming up with a concept for the season, sending someone else, to, someone to start writing, someone else to start writing, you to start writing, yours gets done. You tell them, we need you to finish your scenes that are taking place in the same place as this one because we got to have our film date ne- <coughs> next month. So they go film those three scenes from those three episodes written by three different people, uh, workshopped a little bit, but then you get it back and then you're doing like, the scripts are never done by the time they start filming. That's not yeah. how Hollywood television works. Um, and that really bothers me because I can see it in their storytelling. Um, mm-hmm. And say what you will of, of a long-form book series like The Wheel of Time or something. If you pick up one of those books, Robert Jordan had a chance to revise that whole book and create a Make it exactly what he wanted it to be. For you, rather than, even if the, some of the stuff he came up with off the cuff while he was working on it, he got a chance to integrate that all. Mm-hmm. And so I hope you're right, but I hope they're also willing to tell stories um, a little bit more like a film. Because you usually don't start <laughs> filming your film until your script's done. I know it happens sometimes. Uh, little Donald over here is like, uh, yes, I've seen it happen. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, I call him Little Donald because I know because you know I sh- I need to call Donald. him bi- you need to call him Donald the Younger, not Little Don, because he's not I small. Met him first, yeah. And then I went to his wedding reception and I met his father, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Why are you my age?" Because <laughs> I'm like. He's my friend. He mm. counts as my age. You're yeah. supposed to be an old man. And that's not how it was. Guess what, Dan? <laughs> ben, you're old. Ben, you're old.